leading up to the release of Tenet, which may come out someday. I'm reviewing each and every Christopher Nolan film in release order. This is week number four, and that means we're talking about Batman Begins. Hi, my name is Sean, and I started this channel because I was driving everyone around me crazy talking about movies way too much. If you can relate, you're probably in the right place. Consider clicking that subscribe button. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Let me know your take on Batman Begins. Is it a favorite? Is it one of your least favorites? Where do you fall on this one, especially in light of Christopher Nolan's career and the Dark Knight trilogy itself? As we go into this, I've been trying to talk a little bit about the backstory of where some of these movies came from, so we're going to kick things off talking about the origin of this film. So as we talked about in the previous videos in this series, Christopher Nolan just started as a DIY film director. His first movie following, he made for under $10,000 just with his buddies in his free time. And then, because that movie got some buzz, he did get some funding and some big name Hollywood actors to join him in making Memento, but it was still essentially an indie film. It just had a budget that was significantly larger. After that film, he got the attention of Insomnia, and that was kind of the movie inside of his career that's kind of the least Christopher Nolan because someone else wrote the script. It's a remake of a foreign film. And essentially it was him showing Warner Brothers that he can work within the system. He can manage an actual Hollywood crew, big dynamic A-list actors, and create a film that would be a hit while working in the studio system. So after Insomnia came out and it got really good reviews and did well at the box office, he had a little bit more sway at Warner Brothers. And around this time, they'd been trying to get a Batman movie going for a little while. There were plans for kind of a fifth film in that 80s and 90s franchise that they did, but Batman and Robin, while it actually did make money, was not well received by the general public. Therefore, they canceled their plans for a fifth film that they already had ideas, brainstorm, were working on some casting. They threw that idea out. For a little while, Darren Aronofsky was working on an interpretation of Batman Year One. They had a previous version of Batman v Superman that had a full script. Wolfgang Peterson was signed on to direct it, but all these projects eventually collapsed. I first became interested in, in taking on Batman when I heard that Warner Brothers was looking to renew and reinvent the franchise. But then after the success of Insomnia, Christopher Nolan had a little bit of sway at Warner Brothers. He knew that they were trying to get a Batman film made, and he went and he pitched his idea for what he would do with the franchise, and they dug it, and he was hired to direct the film. But he didn't perceive of himself as a comic book expert, so he wanted to track down a co-writer that was more of an expert in the comics. I've always been a big fan of the character, but I am by no means any kind of comic book expert. I felt I needed a writer on the project who really knew the character inside out. So he tracked down David Goyer, whom he'd known since before Memento came out. I had met Nolan socially before Memento had even been released. <clears throat> he got the gig to reboot Batman, and he called. Now, David Goyer was actually a massive Batman fan that had always wanted to write a Batman film. I remember telling my mother when I was a kid that I was gonna go to Hollywood one day and do a Batman film. But he was so deep into pre-production on Blade Trinity that the timing was really bad. David, unfortunately at that time, said he couldn't possibly write on the script because he only had eight or nine weeks until he was going to go off to, to direct. So he initially turned down the opportunity to work with Nolan on making Batman Begins, but after enough emails, enough phone calls, he changed his mind and decided to work with Nolan. And they spent several months kind of in secret. They hadn't even been announced, kind of trying to crack the code of the story in little coffee shops all around LA. And one of the things they wanted to do while working on this film was actually really tailor the script to the actor that was going to be cast. So before a script was finished, they started trying to track down their Bruce Wayne, and Christian Bale was the first person that Christopher Nolan talked to about the film. But at the time, Christian Bale was over 50 pounds under his normal weight because he was doing this film called The Machinist. According to the script, Resnick's brutal lack of sleep caused him to drop down to just 120 pounds. 
over 60 pounds lighter than Bale's natural weight. Christopher Nolan had seen his previous work, seen how good of physical shape he could get into, so he knew this was his Bruce Wayne, this was his Batman, but tried to convince Warner Brothers that a 120 pound, six foot one guy would be a good Batman. It's a bit of a hard sell. So Christian Bale, very infamously, famously, whatever words you want to use, over the course of like six months, put on like a hundred pounds. I was just stuffing my face all day long and lifting heavy weights and eating more and... And in fact, by the time it was a month away from shooting, got too big. And eventually went went uh, up to like 220 pounds. There was a moment where he was really big and we were thinking, God, is he going to fit the bat suit? Is it, you know, <laughs> how is this going to work? And on set, they were kind of harassing him as they were trying to do a costume tests and he was too big. And a number of the crew I'd worked with on previous movies, they looked at me and they were like, bloody hell, Chris, what are we doing here? Fat man or bat man? So then the last month he then had to drop a bunch of weight really fast so that he could look like a ninja martial artist for the film and get just the right look for it. So they made the film, released it in theaters, and it was very well received by critics. Audiences loved it, but it didn't do nearly as well as the box office as you might think. It only made like $375 million globally, which in certain sense is a great amount of money, but The Dark Knight, Dark Knight Rises went on to make over a billion. Even like Batman v Superman made like $850 million. It's a film that people largely think failed, but it did twice as much money as Batman Begins did because it was a film that was responsible for getting Batman a good reputation again, laying the groundwork, and then The Dark Knight and The Dark Knight Rises are really where things took off. With that said, let's get started talking about the good. And one thing I absolutely love about this film is that it is an origin story. And I love stories of becoming, where people discover their inner potential, they work through their de demons, and they become something better. And this movie is like a nonstop stream of stories of becoming. You see young Bruce Wayne become this broken person because his parents die. You see Bruce Wayne training with Ra's al Ghul. You see Bruce Wayne kind of as a college age person starting to shed his understandings of the world and kind of process through things. And then you see him return to Gotham and go from the trained Bruce Wayne to truly becoming Batman. I love all of that stuff. That is the stuff that just gets me excited, amped up, and want to watch a movie, seeing someone become something more. Another thing I love about this film is that it really puts Bruce Wayne front and center and gives us this Nolanized version of it where we dive into the psychology of what Christopher Nolan thinks would drive a person to do what Batman does. Like if you go back and you look at Batman from 1989, that's the Batman I grew up with. I absolutely love it. It has so much nostalgia for me, but in a lot of ways, Bruce Wayne Batman is kind of on the back burner. They give Joker this very elaborate origin story and we just kind of see these glimpses of Bruce Wayne. In fact, he's not in very much of the first 30 minutes of the film. And here, it really is this exploration of the trauma in his childhood, the broken ways that Bruce Wayne tried to deal with all of this, and the journey that kind of brought him around to turning all of his pain and anger into an effort to try and fix things as a hero. I love that we get that backstory and we get this version of Batman where Christian Bale has kind of like four different performances that he has to give in it. He has 20 year old Bruce Wayne that is very angsty and without direction. Uh, and you have the actual Bruce Wayne as an adult, his real personality that is searching for a mechanism to battle injustice. You have Bruce Wayne, the persona when he returns to Gotham, that's kind of this playboy that's shallow. And then you have when he takes on the Batman persona. And I think he's able to do all of those really well. He's a very versatile actor and he commits to his roles. And so he goes all in on all of them. And uh, you know, as much as people pick on the Batman voice or anything like that, I don't have any problems with any of those sorts of things. And for me, 
This is the movie where I appreciate his performance as Bruce Wayne the most, probably because it is that story of becoming, but also because in that the footage like when he's training, I want Batman to look like a brawler. I want him to look like a guy that can fight people. And in this movie, you see him in the training and he looks like a guy that, you know, as it shows in the prison sequence, he's just throwing guys down, throwing elbows, tackling guys. And he seems like he has the weight to be able to do that. And it seemed like he slimmed down like 20 more pounds when you get to the Dark Knight, the Dark Knight Rises. And uh, I, I wish that he would have kept the size that he had for Batman Begins. But, you know, of performances, his specific weight isn't the most important one, though I think it is with the case of Batman, a characteristic that does matter. It's also an incredibly thematically rich film. Fear is kind of this driving force throughout the film where you have young Bruce Wayne is afraid of things. He's afraid of bats and it drives him out of the theater. When his father gets killed, he's laying there dying and he says, don't be afraid. Batman uses fear as a tactic against uh, the untrained and the undisciplined goons. Uh, and then of course, Scarecrow's the villain who is a fear-based villain. And that's one of the things this movie does so well, really all of the Nolan Batman films do well, is that they kind of pick an idea and it's run throughout the story, it's run throughout the characters in a way that feels organic. It's not beating you over the head, screaming, fear, fear, it's not doing that. It just ties into all these scenes that make sense with the characters and the choice of let's have the villain being scared to it just ties it all together really nicely. And of course, this is a film that has a fantastic cast. We've already talked about Christian Bale that I think he did a great job in this film and all of these films. But then you have Michael Caine as Alfred that just kind of perfectly captures that mentor type role in his life that can be a little bit funny and sarcastic. He can be the person that's being direct and talking to him and uh, kind of fills in that gap as that mentor role. You have Morgan Freeman as Lucius Fox that once again adds just the right amount of humor into the mix. You can buy him as this person that's incredibly intelligent but also got kicked out for being too honest about not wanting to do certain things and got sidelined, eventually fired in the film. Of course, Liam Neeson as Deckard Ra's al Ghul. Um, he What's cool about this performance is that it plays into several different things that Lee Neeson's kind of known for being kind of fatherly figures. There's a lot of fatherly figures in this film to Bruce Wayne. He's a friend to Bruce Wayne and he's the main villain, which is a bit counter to who he normally is. And so it's able to turn all of that in an interesting way. And, um, you know, even as someone that was in his 50s, this is one of those roles that was you know, right before Taken came out, kind of established like this guy, even as he's getting older, he can still grab a sword and to get out he could throw punches and be a physical beast as well as a mentor intelligent strategic all of that stuff now some people picked on like katie holmes in the film i've actually never fully understood some of those criticisms she i think the, the where the com comparisons come from is she's with all of these like oscar level actors and she's just katie holmes and in that regard sure she doesn't compare to the greats I don't know that she's never done anything that was specifically distracting to me in the films. That didn't big bug me, um, except for the fact that she didn't come back for the follow-up film. That's not so cool. But even the rest of the film, all these smaller roles, um, great actors in them, Rudger Hauer, of course, Gary Oldman as Commissioner Gordon, one of these perfect castings that I don't think I would have seen beforehand because I just knew him too much from the movie The Professional where he's a total psycho. And then as soon as he was cast, he was perfect, looked the part, and can play that role uh, wonderfully. A couple other things I really enjoyed about this film is the way that they obviously tried to ground Batman a little bit, so they have him studying and all of this ninjutsu and stuff like that, learning to work in the shadows, so that led to certain action sequences where it almost plays like a horror movie, where he's hopping out, grabbing people, pulling them away, they can't see where he's at, he's like the monster in the shadows, hunting the bad guys, all of that stuff, I think really fits the character. It's cinematic, but it's true to Batman as well. And there's a whole bunch of stuff where they try to come up with a reason behind all of this stuff that he's doing. So it just doesn't come off like fantastical and just comic booky stuff. Also, the movie has a lot more humor than sometimes we remember, uh, especially like the, I remember like the first 
two minutes of the film had three different jokes inside. It was like, oh yeah, this movie has some nicely placed humor all throughout the film. And you know, as you go into it, some of those actors, like I mentioned before, Morgan Freeman, Michael Caine, they just add just enough levity into this film that can be pretty heavy to kind of fill it out, break the tension just enough while not feeling out of place. It's all kind of organic. It feels like the sorts of jokes that people really would make in these moments. And finally, I think this is a movie that does the comic book origin story movie template right. What I mean by that is a whole lot of comic book origin story films follow essentially the same three act kind of structure where act one, you see them before they are famous. Act two, you show them as they become the hero and they have some big success. And then you move into the third act and the villain reveals their secret plan and the hero has to stop them from blowing up the city. A whole bunch of the MCU films kind of follow essentially this exact plot where our hero isn't trying to stop the specific main villain until the third act. Uh, I mean, Ant-Man, Iron Man, Doctor Strange all follow this template. And I think of those movies plus Batman Begins, this is one I think integrates the villain in, in a way that makes the most sense with the film. Where you have the person that's training Bruce Wayne is also the person that shows up at the end as the villain in it. And it's all kind of part of the villain's master plan for what he's trying to do over here. When you get to the middle act where our main villain we think has disappeared, that's not really true. There's a mystery going on in that middle act and the answer to the mystery is our main villain. He's been orchestrating certain things and we learn even what happened early on in Bruce's childhood has ties back to our main villain, what he was trying to do. And so it all feels cohesive. It doesn't feel like, okay, we've got an origin. No, oh, now we need a third act. No, we established very early on that this is what this group of people are trying to do. We make it clear that they've been incorporated in all of these different things. And so I think it fits this structure really nicely where you get a story of becoming, you get lots of action, you get Batman doing some kind of investigative work, you get him battling all sorts of goons, you get him taking out mob guys, you get him taking out League of Assassin peoples, or League of Shadows peoples, uh, you get all of it. Uh, and it fits the structure nicely. And this is a movie that uh, I absolutely love. But there are some problems here, so let's move on to the bad. First problem, and this one's absolutely a nitpick, the title Batman Begins is pretty corny. Now, because the movies have such a great reputation now, we've kind of forgotten the fact that Batman Begins is kind of a goofy title. But when they first announced it, we were like, seriously? The guy that gave us Memento? titled his Batman movie, Batman Begins. They, they couldn't come up with anything better than Batman Begins. Minor criticism, it's a technically correct title, but not the best title you could get. That's a nitpick, I know. Second one on here is I think the movie loses a little bit of steam as soon as Falcone is arrested. So the whole first what is that, hour and 20 minutes of the film is essentially about Bruce becoming Batman and so much of what happened to Bruce Wayne in his childhood, his anger, what drove him to seek the training, goes back to Falcone. And so we wanna see him taken out. So as soon as Bruce Wayne becomes Batman, we have our first Batman sequence. And in that sequence, Falcone is taken out in that moment Right there, it just kind of feels like, oh, we made it, we're done. There's a, there's a little bit of feeling of we made it. So then the movie has to kind of reshuffle a little bit to establish, okay, where's the story going from here? What's the continued tension, conflict that has to overcome? And so then you start having Wayne Tech has disappeared, it's been stolen. They start shuffling some of the crime stuff. And so it kind of feels like this exposition set up for 10 minutes as it has to kind of transition into our third act where Scarecrow and Ra's al Ghul emerge as our primary villains. Third, the car chase in the film feels pretty out of place with everything else that goes on as well as the philosophy of Bruce Wayne where suddenly he escapes and he uses kind of a device that kind of signals bats to come. That's actually a, a, from the Batman Year One comic book. He gets in his Batmobile and gets in this car chase with the police and he's like hopping from building top to building top, which just feels so 
comic booky. It's right up there with Joel Schumacher having the Batmobile drive straight up a wall with a grappling hook. I mean, it's just kind of an, of all the things you could do with a car chase, I don't know why you would go in that direction, especially with a Batmobile that looks like a tank. He's driving through tunnels and flipping police cars over with explosives. This doesn't feel like a responsible thing for Batman to do. And I know you wanna have an exciting car chase, but he's not gonna be blowing up police officers. So that's always kind of stuck out to me. It's like, Ugh, I wish you would have done something different here, would have grounded this. Like there's a, a sequence in Batman year one, the graphic novel, that's kind of the equivalent of this where the police are trying to track him down. And instead of a big spectacle blockbuster car chase with cars flipping over and crashing into buildings, it's like him doing a stealth takeout of police that he's trying to make sure he doesn't really hurt them, but only hurts them so much as he's kind of learning to be Batman. And I think that would have fit better in the film. And finally, I don't think that the action scenes, the fight scenes themselves, for the most part, turned out all that well. Christopher Nolan went into the film and he specifically wanted to move away from all the highly stylized, Hong Kong influenced choreography that had kind of dominated action movies from the late 90s through the early zeros. He wanted violence to feel violent. A lot of very, well, I think excessive use of you know, wire work and martial arts and everything, to the point where um, the violence loses its threat because it's become a bit, I think, a bit dance-like and we've become sort of comfortable watching it in that way. And all of that sounds great to me. Like, I'm totally fine with action that you feel it and you understand damage is being done and it's not about dance-like moves, but about one guy trying to take out another guy. Sounds awesome. And to do this, they went and kind of got this thing called the Casey Fighting Method. The DVD of the actual original DVD of this movie had some uh, extensive special features about the fighting system they went with. And there's all this footage of the creators of the Casey Fighting Method and the stuntmen for the film doing demo reels and showing the choreography with just them doing it. And it looks really cool and it looks violent and it looks unlike the stuff that we'd been seeing in Hollywood movies over the previous 10 years and Hong Kong movies over the previous 20 years. I just don't think it translated well to a guy in a 80 pound rubber suit with limited mobility, with a cape. And as soon as you have Batman in the suit trying to do it, it just doesn't look the same. And it add to that, the way that Christopher Nolan even shot a lot of this is so chaotic that you can't see the choreography anyway. Like if you take the doc sequence, for example, part of it is it's doing kind of this horror element to it of Batman pulling guys out of the shadows. I'm totally fine with that. And then perhaps another part to it is when Falcone looks at Batman fighting a group of thugs, it's kind of cutting real quick back and forth and you just see hands doing this stuff and guys flying backwards. And I guess psychologically, it's tr he's, Nolan is trying to show what Falcone is seeing. And so it's just chaotic and it's just guys getting taken out by this creature in the darkness. Now I get what he's going for uh, in theory there, but if you look at the film as a whole, all of the fight scenes kind of have that choppy nature to the way they're cut. Look at this fight at the end of the film where he's fighting Ra's al Ghul's goons and it has just as many cuts to it as like Taken 2 had, which is just overly edited, lots of close-ups. And so you just see a quick arm flying, body fly backwards, punch thrown, kick, and you don't get an idea of the geography. You don't get an idea of the actual choreography. How is Batman taking these guys out? And I, I just don't think that that's the best way to shoot action and it doesn't look like the choreography was as strong as it looked in all the demo reels. And I mean, this is one of the reasons that people praise the warehouse fight in Batman v Superman because we'd just gotten a decade of great Christopher Nolan films, but the way that he always shot the action didn't feel like it captured the way I think a lot of us think that Batman would actually be in a fight. It was never quite as exciting. And then you see this weird help fight scene where Batman is moving quickly, just tossing guys around, body slams, punches, all of it. And it captured it much better. And so I think that's one of the things where this movie really kind of dropped the ball on something where they were very intentional. It's not like they hadn't thought about it. There's literally full special features on the DVD and the Blu-ray about their 
thought process for the fight scenes, I just don't think it translated all that well to film. Anyway, I'm diving into the specifics on all this because I'm an action movie junkie, so I love to talk about fight choreography and things like that. At the end of the day, this is a movie that I really, really enjoy. Real quick, before I give you my final score on this one, be sure to tell me what you thought down below in the comments section, especially you know, if you liked the fight choreography and all the choppy cutty stuff with them, let me know your defense of Christopher Nolan's way that he shot his action sequences in this film. Also remember, I'm going through all the Christopher Nolan films. They're right up here in this playlist. So as of right now, I've got the four movies from this series right now, and I reviewed Dunkirk when it first came out. You can check that out right up here. When it comes to just personal taste, this is probably my favorite Batman movie because I love origin stories, stories of becoming. So this explores so many things that I love superhero movies to do with one of my top two favorite superheroes. And so for personal reasons, I love this film, but I do think it does have a few problems inside of it with the story, the pacing, the way some things work out, and the way that Nolan captured some of the action. But still, a great film and one that I absolutely love. Overall, I'm gonna give this film an A-, minus, but on the entertainment scale, it's a 9.5, and you should absolutely watch this film. If you want to see the rest of my Nolan reviews, you can check them out right over there. Also, if you want some more Batman content, you've got it right down there. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies too much.